Okay, so we're getting ready to move into the high renaissance. And I wanted to start by sharing this chart with you. So for each time period that we go over, I have gridded out a chart for um, the time period. So if you look at this chart, if you go all the way over to the left hand side, you see chapter and time period. And then I list high renaissance in Florence and Italy. And then the stylistic features, which are um, the form is constructed by looking at a drawing. Um, light is dispersed evenly. And high renaissance works have idealistic elements combined with realistic elements. Then I list artists or famous pieces and then whatever background information that pertains to it. This type of chart helps me keep information straight um, and really helped me a lot when I was in um, grad school with some of the more complex art historical eras that I learned about. So my suggestion to you is to make a chart like this for each time period. It will help you keep information straight as I know you've got a lot of information coming at you all at once. So typically we can break down um, each style by listing the stylistic characteristics of the era. Uh, for example, we know that High Renaissance art in Italy is characterized by two major elements, the idealistic and the realistic. So idealism plus realism equal High Renaissance. And I'm going to show you how in just a moment. There are two schools of thought in terms of depiction in High Renaissance work. The first school of thought is called Colore. Um, the second one is called Diseño. I'll explain more um, what each style is, but for now, know that the Raphaelites, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael, all work in the Diseño style. Um, this is where the painting is based on a drawing, and it tends to be somewhat sculptural. Um, here you see the corkscrew turn of the torso, uh, a pyramidal shape that dictates the placement of the figures. Um, but the figures here, they, they always begin with a drawing. And so because of that, they tend to have sort of a sculpted feel. Uh, the Madonna here is depicted in an idealized fashion uh, because she's youthful, she doesn't have any blemishes, she has these light rosy cheeks, um, a little bit of an olive undertone, and the baby is idealized as well. It has a sense of serenity and calmness. So the first major artist we're going to look at here is Leonardo da Vinci. Um, da Vinci comes up with a set of principles that many artists still use today. He was a polymath, um, a man who could do many things. He studied humans and animals uh, through cadavers. Fluid dynamics, weaponry, cartography, stage design, music composition, uh, he played the flute, costume design, he designed a sewer system for the city of Milan. He was a painter, a sculptor, and an architect. He was also the illegitimate son of a notary, and he never mastered Latin or Greek. Uh, he was interested in the direct observation of the world. Here is one of da Vinci's more famous paintings. It's called the Madonna of the Rocks. Da Vinci was one of the very first artists to come up with a set of principles that lots of people follow today. I mentioned that he was a polymath. Um, that just means that he could do lots of different things. The, Madonna, the Virgin of the Rocks um, is a typical painting in the Da Vinci style. It has an odd setting 
in the sense that when you look at this painting, you don't see a natural placement for the painting in terms of landscape. The background isn't something that you could walk outside of your door and say, oh, that's exactly what Leonardo was painting. Um, the figures in the composition are having a sacred conversation, just like the slide that we looked at um, last lecture, uh, the sacred conversation that Nani DeManco's Four Crown Saints were having, similar concept. The four figures here point at each other, they look at each other, they're talking to each other, they're communicating with each other, and the viewer is not part of that scenario. Um, we see lots of humanism. This is Mary, but she looks just like a normal Florentine citizen. Um, she wears rich colored clothing, um, nice colored clothing, but all at the same time, very much a human being. And the babies are very baby-like. Um, we see a new technique called sfumato, and I will um, dissect that a little bit more for you when we get to the Mona Lisa. But we also see sort of a light veil. Um, and what I mean by that is you can see the light tends to catch the skin tones of the people. Um, but the entire painting tends to have this like slight veil over top of it um, that keeps everything from being really sharp and crisp, which is a signature of Da Vinci's. This is Da Vinci's most iconic work um, and probably one of the famous, most famous works of art in the history of art, The Last Supper. Um, it was created for a refectory in a monastery. A refectory is a place where the monks eat. Um, it's sort of a dining hall um, in Milan, in Italy. Um, it makes sense that it's a dining scene because it was in the place where the monks would dine. And what you're looking at is the exact moment after the Last Supper um, in which Jesus tells his disciples that one of them will betray him. Um, and so they're all reacting to what Jesus had just said. You can see that the transversals and orthogonals all disappear or converge at the same point right in the center where Jesus sits. Michelangelo worked on this particular work of art for three years, um, and when he did the, when he finished the painting, um, he actually had used an experiment uh, to create the. Um, Fresco. So fresco typically is made of tempera and a water-based plaster paint, or water-based plaster and tempera. Um, tempera is egg-based, and so it mixes in well with the plaster. Unfortunately, um, da Vinci really wanted to use oils, but it needed to be part of the wall, and so he decided that he would try mixing the oil paints with the fresco material, or, yeah, with the plaster material for the fresco. It didn't work. Um, it bubbled up uh, and the plaster, the water in the plaster and the oil in the paint separated. And so he had to go back and refinish it several times. Um, it's been restored a couple times. And so that restoration has brought about some interesting things in the history of art. Da Vinci's main um, goal here was to convey the inner intention of the man's soul. He felt like by creating characters that were highly emotional um, and showed great gesture that he was giving the viewer an insight to the character's emotional and mental state. You can see that he groups all of the people in sets of threes, 
that is part of that idealism that he uses in terms of the Holy Trinity and the humanist concept of divine beings being here on earth. Jesus sits in the middle of the table. He has passed the bread. This is the moment in which we get the Eucharist ceremony from, where Jesus would have held up the bread and said, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this as often, often in remembrance of me. Then he would have picked up the um, chalice that had wine in it and said, Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you. And um, each person at the table would have drank. So he then gets in a discussion with his disciples and tells one of them that they would um, give up his identity to the Roman soldiers. And so they're all conversing about this. See if you can pick out the person that is Judas in this particular setting. That would be the person who gave Jesus up. Judas is the man that sits here at the front of the canvas. Um, his face is turned completely away from the audience at all, um, and he's not looking at the audience. We get the back of his head. Uh, let's see if I can. I'll underline him here for you. This guy here. So then I always ask my students, do you think Michael or Leonardo da Vinci was successful at communicating the inner intention of the man um, based on the fact that you could or couldn't find Judas? Um, interesting things about this painting. It has an interesting history in that it's really been the building that it's been housed in has been through a lot. Um, let me show you the next slide. It's a panned out version of The Last Supper. Hold on. So the last video gave you um, quite a bit of information about Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper. And I just want to um, sort of break down a few of the things that I said so that you can more cl clearly understand um, da Vinci's technique and the things that were so miraculous about this painting. First of all, this painting had a lot of symbolism in it. We know that the Italian artists had seen the oil paintings that were done in the um, Netherlands in the early Northern Renaissance time. So we know that he saw Van Eyck. Um, that happened because of the Portinari altarpiece. And they were inspired by the um, symbolism that came from the Northern European artists. And so they want to imbue this symbolism into their paintings, but they do it on a much more, um, it's a more intellectual level to some degree, instead of them being objects that are linked to sayings or objects that stand for something, um, they're symbols that are imbued into their theology. And so you see that da Vinci groups everybody into groups of three. This is a symbol for the Holy Trinity. Um, in this image, I'm showing you exactly the different groups of three. Um, but he also has a group of seven, and that is the large, well, if you count each group of three as one, one, two, three. Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. There is a, a numerology of seven in here. I, I would have to go back and look it up to show you, but Jesus is the one that makes the seventh person. So we know that in Christianity, numerology is significant in terms of three, four, and seven. And so we know that numerology was highly imbued into this painting, um, specifically with groups of three and with Jesus being the seventh, um, the 
image that's connected to the number seven. Also, he uses the new Italian one point perspective. So this painting's highly innovative. It takes everything that the Northern Renaissance artists were doing and uses that um, technology, but it also takes all of the new Italian technology um, with the perspective. So you can see how all of the receding lines converge at Jesus's head, um, making Jesus important or the most important thing in the image. Additionally, um, in terms of them taking all of the innovation, Da Vinci wants to use the innovation of oil paints. And we're gonna see how that plays out here momentarily. Okay, I wanted to give you a close up of how Da Vinci shows the inner intention of the man. So I told you in the beginning that what Da Vinci does in terms of idealism or realism, excuse me, realism, is to show the inner intention of the man's soul. That was his desire. He felt like if he could show the inner intention of the man's soul, then he was showing ultimate realism. I mean, aside from the fact that this is a fresco painting and the people are very realistic looking, um, you have realism that is so real that um, they look just like any everyday ordinary human being. Um, the inner intention of the man's soul was communicated through gesture and facial expression. In this image, you can see that the men on the end, this is the right hand side of the table, are conversing. They're talking about what Jesus has just said. This is the moment in which Jesus says, one of you will betray me. And so he's conveying that uh, through gesture and through their emotional conversation. So this image um, shows you what was left over from the original um, painting versus what was reconstructed. So in the original uh, or the slide that I showed you the entire Last Supper, I told you that the painting has a bit of a sordid um, past in terms of history. Uh, it survived many bombings. And the first thing that it survived that was really traumatic for it had to do with um, the French Revolution. Napoleon used the refectory as horse stables during the French Revolution. Um, I can't give you a picture of it because there wasn't a camera at the time. Uh, however, this image gives you a good idea of what they had to reconstruct after the bombing of World War II. So everything that you see here um, that looks like brand new fresh white plaster that is all um, brand new post-World War II building. Um, the things that you see that are in color, um, those are things that were actually preserved after the bombing from, an, um, from antiquity whenever the church was originally created. So you can see that um, they were able to save the painting itself and they were able to save a little bit of the walls of the refectory, but that's about it. So the fact that the painting actually survived, it was a miracle upon itself. This image shows you um, how they protected the painting so that it did survive. They built a wall of sandbags and then braced the, um, and well, sandbags and braces so that they could protect the wall. And you can see um, in this image, uh, this image is from the Getty uh, Studios. Uh, it's a picture that was put in the paper after the bombing um, of Milan during World War II. And you can see how much destruction was done to the church. Uh, the bell tower actually survives quite intact, but the rest of the um, monastery was pretty much gone. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the restoration of the painting. If we go all the way back to Da Vinci's time, 
Um, I told you that da Vinci was a very innovative painter. He was so innovative that he wanted to use the materials that he saw coming out of the Northern Renaissance painting painters. He knew that those oil painting or the oil paints themselves gave the artist the ability to create a very realistic figure um, that had great detail in it. And he wanted to capture that detail. And he thought, what if I could do that in my fresco? And so he paints the painting with oil paint. Unfortunately, this is an experiment that really doesn't work. Oil and water separate whenever they cure or whenever the painting had cured and the whole thing bubbled up. And three years later, he had to go back and completely repaint the entire thing or repaint most of it. Um, from there, because of the painting's past and having lots of uh, traumatic things happen in its wake, there were some restorations that happened that really sort of changed our understanding of what Leonardo da Vinci originally intended when he painted this painting. Um, but first and foremost, there was a restoration that was done in the 1970s. And that restoration in the 1970s, we, we, some people, some historians feel that the restoration changed the painting, that not a lot of da Vinci's original intentions are there. Um, the restorer, uh, went in and painted um, over top of da Vinci's work. Um, that's what we restorers do. They um, learn how to create chemical processes that were um, done in antiquity so that they can restore the work to its original splendor. And so when she restored the work, she believed that there was a woman sitting at Jesus's left-hand side and um, she thought that the original painting had Jesus's mouth open instead of Jesus's mouth closed. And there were some things that happened with Jesus's hands that we don't know whether or not they were da Vinci's original design. So um, in recent years, in order to learn about da Vinci's painting, they've done some studies. You can see the woman on the right hand side, she's using a laser camera. That laser camera is analyzing the paint um, and analyzing the information underneath the plaster so that they can um, get a better understanding of what da Vinci really intended when he, when he painted The Last Supper. Now, the paintings um, that we're doing in terms of restoration are digital. So digital technology has allowed us to preserve the original chemical composition and not alter it in any way, shape or form, but also try to understand what the Last Supper actually looked like in antiquity. That restoration process has been a very fascinating one. It's been an enlightening process. And if it's something that you're interested in, I encourage you to scan this QR code that's here um, the QR code will take you to an article that walks you through the digital restoration process. It will also tell you a lot about what they've discovered da Vinci's original painting had in it. Last but not least, this is da Vinci's original, or this is the um, restored digital restoration of The Last Supper. Uh, you can see that the ceiling has depth to it. Um, in the original, we don't get to see those recessed coffers. Um, that's the squares in the ceiling quite as clearly. You get a very clear understanding of what that woman to the left of Jesus's side looked like. Um, you get an understanding of how da Vinci used um, gesture and body position to convey the intention of the man more so because you get a very clear understanding what the facial features looked like. Um, Judas is completely turned away from the um, canvas to the point where you can't see uh, hardly any of his face. It's not just the back of his head, but you can only see about like, you know, maybe an eighth 
of his face. And that was important because it was what um, conveyed that he is Judas along with the bag of silver that he holds in his hand. So from the fame of The Last Supper, Leonardo da Vinci um, ends up with a lot more commissions, uh, one of them being the Mona Lisa, uh, also one of the most iconic works of art in the history of art. Um, the Mona Lisa, believe it or not, is not very large. It's only about the size of um, two sheets of paper. It has a front and a back. A lot of people don't realize it has a back side. The back side has a still life on it. Um, it's made, or it's painted on a wood panel with oil paint. And so uh, typically a Renaissance artist would paint the back of the panel um, just to give it some visual interest. If you go to the Louvre today, the Mona Lisa is sandwiched in between two pieces of glass. Um, and you can see on uh, you can see the front and back side of the painting. Um, it's also housed in this, um, it's housed inside a large wall made of hickory. It's a light color blonde wood. Um, the room is really big to accom accommodate quite a few um, visitors to the museum. Uh, and the wall that was created to hold the Mona Lisa um, is really large. It runs the length of the entire room. Honestly, when you get there, you're really expecting something spectacular because it is the Mona Lisa after all. And it's a little underwhelming because it's so small um, and because the crowd is so big that you can hardly get to it. Um, my suggestion, if you ever go to the Louvre to see the Mona Lisa, is get there early. Uh, so that you can actually see what you're there to see. The paintings are in, in the room around the Mona Lisa are actually the more fascinating of the works of art. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the Mona Lisa itself. We know that the sitter uh, for the portrait was a wife of a lawyer, um, but we don't know much, that much about her. She was of no particular social standing. She would have been um, in the upper middle class but she wasn't royalty or anything like that. Um, Leonardo breaks some conventions of portraiture that had been established um, in the early Renaissance with this particular work of art. And so that's really why the Mona Lisa is so famous. It's because it, it, Leonardo painting it changed the face of portraiture forever. Um, before the Mona Lisa, the Italians liked to paint uh, people in the side profile view as opposed to um, a front profile view. Uh, at some point, people realized that no one is uh, painted in a flattering light through a side profile view. Um, in fact, Van Eyck knew that and that's why he painted the three-quarter profile. Um, the Mona Lisa is a little bit more than three-quarter profile because you can fully see all of the front part of her face. Um, she sits for Leonardo with her knees uh, directed at a wall and her torso turned to parallel the picture plane. Um, that pose becomes a standard of portraiture that's used even today. Um, he crosses her arms over top of a table that she is um, parallel with. And so he lays her hands one on top of the other. He doesn't paint a wedding ring of any sort, so we don't think that this was a particular like portrait for a husband or something of that nature. It may have been that she was the um, wife of a lawyer who um, the wife passed away in childbirth, but we don't know for sure. Um, da Vinci creates a new technique called sfumato. It's F, it's S, F-U-M-A-T-O. It's an Italian word that means smoky. You can see the sense of smoky and haziness um, on her face in the jawline and at the edges of the eyes. Um, the background of the portrait also has a like, light veiling to it. And Leonardo is famous for these hazy, unnatural looking landscapes that he puts behind his portraits. Um, they're 
places that don't seem real um, and they seem sort of mystical. We don't know why he preferred those type of landscapes, but he did. Um, and they sort of make the sitter stand out a little bit more. Um, he was very good at textures. You can tell that by looking at the Mona Lisa's dress and the texture of her hair. Um, having a tall forehead was a, a mark of beauty at this time. With this particular portrait, we are looking at the ideal beauty uh, or the ideal feminine beauty in Italy in the 16th century. Um, there's been much, much speculation about who the person in the portrait is, uh, mostly because Leonardo da Vinci never gave the portrait to the people who commissioned it. Um, some speculated that uh, she was his lover and that um, when she sat for the portrait, they fell in love through the art contact and that he never ended up giving it up because he was in love with her. But it, that's just a rumor. We don't really have any proof of that. This is Da Vinci's The Vitruvian Man. Um, he drew The Vitruvian Man after he read a book um, from the philosophies of an ancient Egyptian philosopher. The Vitruvian Man links the human body's proportions to basic scientific geometric shapes like the square and the circle. Um, and here, this is the idea that uh, da Vinci is just linking the um, humanist idea that man uh, was created by God and that nature is reflected in the harmony of mathematics um, and therefore man is a creation of logic and reasoning. This is Raphael's The Small Cowper Madonna. Raphael um, was a student of Perugino's. Perugino was someone that Raphael met in his home of Urbino. I know there's lots of rhyming words in that. Um, the bottom line is Raphael eventually moves to Florence um, where he sees the work of Michelangelo. Um, he would have seen the work of Donatello there, um, and he would have been exposed to the pyramidal composition that tends to be so popular in the high Renaissance time. Um, the other thing that is important about this work of art is that it is a good example of what Desenio style looks like in the high Renaissance. Desenio style starts with a uh, drawing. The figure itself begins, um, or the painting itself, begins with a figural drawing. Um, because it begins with a drawing, it seems as if the figures are more solid looking. They have more of a sculptural feel to them. If you look at um, when we get to the Colore paintings, you'll be able to see the difference. Um, but also, I want to point out to you the idealism in this particular painting versus the realism. So the pyramidal composition is obviously an idealistic composition. Um, the baby's size is an idealistic size. Um, a baby who's a small infant would not be that large. Um, they also, Raphael also highlights the human condition by um, emphasizing the baby's relationship to the mom. Um, so this is Jesus um, being held by Mary. Um, in that sense, this is an idealized work of art, but it also has realism because the people are biblical figures, but they're represented as realistic people. Um, Jesus being the baby and Mary being um, Jesus's mom. So he emphasizes those human relationships um, and that makes this a very realistic portrait. In the background, you see the Italian hallmark of the landscape. 
it's not as um, hazy and unrealistic as Leonardo da Vinci's landscape techniques. Uh, he really tries to make the landscape look as if it is in a real setting. Um, and of course you see the entire figure much like um, we saw the Mona Lisa's upper torso we get a sense of how large the entire figure is. Here I have traced the corkscrew shape of the spine that we've been talking about as a stylistic hallmark of the High Renaissance. Um, you can see how the baby's body twists in space as his um, bottom is more parallel to the viewer and his shoulder blades are more parallel to the Madonna. Here I'm drawing out the pyramidal composition for you. Um, if you start with a line at the top of Mary's head and draw um, it down to the side of her hips on each side of her head and then once again to the knee, you see that you get the perfect pyramid. It's a pyramid that's based on the equilateral triangle. In this way, um, the Renaissance masters liken the human figure to nature and reason and logic, log, logic sorry, um, just the same way we talked about Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvius Man. And just so you see that I don't favor Raphael over Leonardo da Vinci, um, I wanted to show you the corkscrew turn of the baby's body in Leonardo da Vinci's work as well. Um, if you look at, this is a zoomed in version of da Vinci's Madonna of the Rocks, and you can see the baby pointing um, up to Jesus in a sacred conversation. Um, the baby sits with its um, bottom one direction, and then his shoulders are slightly turned um, towards the Madonna. This gives the figure a greater sense of movement, even though in the painting he's not actually moving, he's, stand, he's sitting still. Um, it accentuates the gesture that we see. The room that you're looking at is the room in the Vatican that was used by Pope Julius II as a library and a private office. Um, it is the first work of art that Raphael um, was commissioned for from the Vatican. He was commissioned to create the frescoes that you see on the walls. Um, the room itself is in the Stanza della Segnatura, um, which is part now of the Vatican Museum. So what you see here is a panned out version of the frescoes. The next slide will be a close up version of um, one of the frescoes that he does. This is the School of Athens um, by Raphael. It is a close-up of the fresco from the room that we just looked at. Raphael creates an architectural space within the fresco that is reminiscent of classical antiquity. You can see the barrel vaults have a decorative honeycomb pattern on them. Those barrel vaults um, reflect something called a coffer. A coffer is a recessed indentation in the ceiling that helps to alleviate the weight of a dome. Um, the barrel vault was something that was commonly used. It was invented in classical antiquity. And so in order to pay homage to the architectural developments of classical antiquity, Raphael chooses to um, create a room based on barrel vaulting. Um, I said earlier that the barrel vault ceilings were decorated with coffers, um, that coffers usually are inside of a dome. They can also be inside of a barrel vault as a decorative element. On the right and the left in the background, you see two statues. Those statues are Athena and Apollo. And then the people that are gathered together are a meeting of the Western minds of philosophy. Some of them are from antiquity, some of them are from Raphael's day. 
Um, but they all were people who were monumental in philosophical ideal sets in this time period. Um, you see the two men in the center. That is Apollo. Oh, I'm sorry. That is Plato and Socrates. Plato points at the ceiling. Socrates holds a book. They are gathered in a large meeting space. Pythagoras is there. Um, he has a set of scales that he's using. Um, if you remember, Pythagoras is the one responsible for the Pythagorean theorem, the a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, and of course, like most of the high Renaissance masters, uh, the Raphael is likening humanity with math as much as possible. Um, in the lower right-hand corner is a philosopher named Herculeus. Um, a, Herculeus was a philosopher, but the head of Herculeus was taken from a portrait of Michelangelo. And on the right, students congregate, congregate sorry, around Euclid. Um, Euclid was responsible for... Um, mathematical theorems. And then just right of Euclid, we see Zoaster. Um, in that area, we see a self-portrait of Raphael. And so he's likening the artists to being geniuses, just like the philosophers of his time. This is Michelangelo's Pieta. Um, it was supposed to be sculpted to go over a cardinal's tomb, but um, Michelangelo creates the sculpture from a subject matter that hadn't been previously explored thoroughly. It was more popular in the northern Renaissance areas, um, this idea of Mary holding Jesus um, after he had descended from the cross, um, which in Christian folklore is called the Pieta. Um, Michelangelo takes a Northern Renaissance idea and puts it into the High Renaissance Italian formula of real plus ideal. He creates the ideal part by showing how Mary and Jesus could fit together in a perfect pyramid. But he also changes how Mary and Christ interact in terms of their depiction. The intimacy of the scene comes from Mary's peaceful, bowed down head and Jesus' limp body that's not being shown in emotion or anguish. The Northern Renaissance pietas tend to be very gruesome. They tend to be bloody and um, full of sorrow and deep emotion. But Michelangelo creates a scene that is serene and quiet and still. This particular work was actually signed by him. Um, it's now at the Vatican, but you can't get close to it. Um, the fame of this sculpture moves Michelangelo to Florence, and that's where he takes over and sculpts the David. But before we move to the David, um, I want to tell you a little bit more about this sculpture. The Pietà is the um, one sculpture that has been defaced many times in the history of art. It creates such an emotional reaction from viewers that they've had to put it behind um, plate glass 
so that you can't get close to it because it's um, been damaged many times by viewers um, taking uh, objects to it and hammering it and things like that. So let's look at David. The sculpture of David was commissioned to be um, set at the facade of the Florence Cathedral. Um, it was commissioned by the Republic of Florence and it was commissioned after the Republic had fallen out of control of the Medici family and into the occupation of the Goths. Um, the Medicis in the early Renaissance had economically fueled most of Florence. Unfortunately, now um, the Goths are in control of the economic um, resources and the lawmaking that's going on in Florence. The Medicis have been exiled. Um, they were exiled in 1494 um, because they were so powerful. There were laws against people having too much wealth or too much money and too much control. Excuse me, in the um, government. And so they were exiled. The city of Florence was constantly under um, the threat of invasion because it had lots of natural resources, but also just because that was a climate of the Italian side or of Italy at that time. Um, when the Republic commissions Michelangelo from Michelangelo the David, um, they wanted to go on the facade of the Florence Cathedral. It was originally made for something for a space that would be 30 feet off of the ground. It took Michelangelo three years to make the work of art, um, and he sculpted it from a block of stone that had actually been quarried about 40 years prior. It had a flaw in it, and he was trying to figure out what he wanted to do um, with that particular piece of marble, and for whatever reason, um, he felt like David could come from that particular piece of marble. The David statue is remarkable in that Michelangelo utilized the ideas of classical antiquity as a formula for creating the David. Um, Michelangelo fully masters at this time the ideals of classical antiquity. Um, but it's not as stoic as the figures that he used for reference in the classical eras, areas of Greece and Rome. Um, classical sculptures often look very serene. They don't look like they have a whole lot of um, energy or excitement going on. They just like look sort of like a marble copy of a human body. And so Michelangelo um, completely interprets the story of Goliath and David differently than what we're familiar with. Look closely and see if you can figure out what part of the story of Goliath and, and David that Michelangelo actually keeps. I hope you came up with the fact that he holds the slingshot in his left hand. Because other than that, that's really the only bar part of the story that Michelangelo retains in this sculpture. Um, a lot of the sculpture is distorted. It was distorted somewhat through the hands and the head um, the musculature is overly exaggerated. You can see how um, very emphasized the abdominal musculature is. He wanted to give life to the sculpture. He wanted to bring emotion and idealism to the sculpture. Um, we think the hands were a little bit out of proportion because if the sculpture had gone 30 feet off the ground, you wouldn't have been able to see the hand from below. Um, 
but it also was a symbol. Um, the large hands would have been a symbol to the Florentine people that David was there to fight and protect them. Um, Michelangelo created this statue by covering it for the entire three years that he worked on it. Um, he worked on it in public view, but he hung a enclosed curtain so nobody could see what he was doing. And when he unveiled the sculpture, people were quite flabbergasted and taken back by the sculpture. It was unveiled in the Palazzo Vecchio, which is the main palazzo there in Florence. Um, and people fell in love with it. And so instead of putting it on the facade of the cathedral, they decided that they were going to leave it in the town square. Um, in a way, they look at David as being the ideal Florentine. When the Medicis were exiled, um, the economy of Florence went down, the civic pride of Florence was rattled, and things were a little chaotic. And so the David sits um, pointed towards the river, hoping to watch in return for the Medici family. You can see that in depicting the story, Michelangelo keeps the sling that David used to shoot the stone at Goliath. Um, but we see a very different David than what we saw in the early Renaissance. We see a David that's strong and powerful um, and is a grown man. Um, the fame of the David caused Pope Julius to call Michelangelo to Rome and to work for him. And so this was a major movement in Michelangelo's career because he started in Florence and then um, ended up moving to Rome where a lot of his works are in the Vatican. So as a result of the fame of David's sculpture, or the sculpture of David, Michelangelo was commissioned um, to do the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel by Pope Julius II. Um, Michelangelo had never done a ceiling fresco before. Uh, he had never done a large project like this before. And in fact, when given the commission, he told Pope Julius II that he didn't want to do it. He said, I'm a sculptor, not a painter. And Julius said, okay, you do a fresco for me and I will commission a sculpture from you right after you finish it. And so Michelangelo takes on the challenge. Um, the frescoes are in the Pope's chapel at the Vatican. They are roughly 45 feet tall and 128 feet long. The ceiling is done with scenes from the Old Testament. Um, the judgment is on the wall. Creation, fall, redemption narratives. The ignudi, ancestors, prophets, sibyls, and the architectural framework are all done on the walls you can see some of the architectural framework that rises up to the ceiling, but for the most part, the um, only thing that's on the ceiling are the Old Testament stories. Right now, what you're looking at is the entranceway where you can, where the um, people would have walked up to the altar there, um, this place right here. You can also see some of the other paintings that we've studied. This is Perugino's, um, a painting by Perugino. Um, so not, it wasn't just Michelangelo that painted in the Sistine Chapel, but he was the main painter of the Sistine Chapel. The fresco that you see here in the center, here, it is actually um, a Mannerist work of art, and we'll look at it a little bit more closely here in just a minute. 
a lot of people thought that Michelangelo actually um, painted the fresco by laying on his back. And you get a sense when you walk into the chapel that it is that way because um, it's so tall. And to look up at it, you really just have to crook your neck straight back um, in order to see everything. But um, we know for sure that Michelangelo didn't paint the chapel while laying down. He um, built scaffolding and painted um, just the same way you would look at it, standing straight up with your neck turned backwards. When he first begins, you can tell that he's still working out some of the details in the representation of the figures um, because they're not as strong as the ones that you see at the very end. Um, when you get to compare the different works of art or the different scenes together, uh, you get a sense that he learns as he goes. He's not willing to do the painting um, sort of half and he's never painted a fresco before and so because of this um, he's really got this big learning curve that he's got to figure out and he wants the painting to be professional and to look um, good be or better than all of his other artist um, friends that are painters and so um, he really just isn't willing to give himself a break when it comes to the learning curve. He was really close to the fresco whenever he started painting it, like physically from uh, where he was standing to the fresco. And so in the beginning, he's not thinking about the fact that people are going to be looking at the fresco from the floor. And so as um, he keeps going with the fresco, uh, hands get larger, the heads get larger, things that would have been lost in detail by looking at them from the floor. Um, start to enlarge just like we saw um, Michelangelo's statue of David he made the hands bigger because you were going to be seeing it from the floor so after he gets like the solid thing hang of things when it comes to um, the, the representation of the figures he finally moves on to paint what would be considered one of the most important masterpieces in um, the ceiling frescoes. That would be the creation of Adam. So I mentioned that um, Michelangelo sort of takes some time to work out what he thinks the figure should look like because he never painted a fresco before um, and he wants a fresco that is perfect in the sense that it has as much professionalism and as much believability as his sculptures do. Um, when he first begins the ceiling frescoes, uh, you can see that he's still working that information about the figure out. If you're looking at my slide on the left hand side, you see detail from the Dolge, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. That particular um, painting, you can see that he really doesn't focus on the features of the face quite so much. And you can't see his the hands very well. Um, this is where he's still working out what that figure is going to look like. Um, the not only does he change the way he represents the facial features and the hands and the feet. He also makes the colors stronger and he makes the compositions a lot simpler. So the piece that you see here on the left is one that was done before the piece here on the right. The piece on the right is the Sybil. Um, he painted it about a year um, well, at some point, we know he took time off of painting the Sistine Chapel. Um, Pope Julius was running out of money, and he, Michelangelo was really fighting. He did not want to paint it. Um, and in fact, he went to Pope Julius and said, I really don't want to do this. 
And Pope Julius says, please finish it for me and I will commission this sculpture from you. And so he goes back to finish it. And you can see that the paintings tend to be a lot more sculptural in feeling. They have a lot more weight to them. They're simpler. Um, the painting of the Sybil has very clear facial features. While the hands and feet aren't quite as large as what we will see when he pa paints his um, sort of, oh, the crescendo moment, the excitement of the high of the Sistine Chapel in the creation of Adam or the um, temptation of Eve, we do see that he is learning to make the compositions more clear and more simple and um, figuring out how to make the figure dominate the area of the picture so it can be seen from the floor. <laughs> So before we head to looking at those central panels right here in the center, um, these ones, I just wanted to give you sort of a map of exactly where the different frescoes are. I encourage you to go online and look at um, YouTube videos about the Sistine Chapel. It'll tell you, um, you'll actually get to see a lot more of the detailed um, Oh, focus detail of the frescoes themselves um, because it would take me an entire PowerPoint class to show you just the Sistine Chapel. Um, so I really encourage you to do outside research about this if you're interested in it um, because the paintings are just fascinating and you'll learn a lot. So here you see Michelangelo's creation of Adam. It's on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It was um, the final three center panels that Michelangelo created. What you're looking at right now is in the lower half here, you see is the creation of Adam. And then where I have this word ignudi um, in the center of these two figures, the word ignudi refers to the style in which the two figures are done in. They're very muscular and they're very um, their bodies have a very classic look to them they um, were basically nude men that were young and don't have a religious connection um, and they're used to separate the scenes they're probably a pagan symbol um, because they don't have a biblical connection Michelangelo did lots of these ignudi figures. There were 21 of them in the entire um, Sistine Chapel program. And you can see that they sort of um, help bridge the gap between the two fresco paintings. When we look at Michelangelo's The Creation of Adam, you can see that Adam reaches out to, um, well, actually, he reaches from God's hand um, where he sits on the earth. Uh, he sits in the nude, and he's relaxing there on the surface of the earth. God floats in the center of this interestingly pink, large shell of fabric. This um, fabric that is opened like a balloon is something that's a common motif used in Renaissance um, painting. You can see that there are figures behind God. Um, they are all nude, and he carries the figures behind him. God wears this pink dress-like sheath of fabric. Um, it clings to the body, but not so much as it did in as the garments did in classical antiquity. Um, there's been lots of controversy around the depiction of God here in the Sistine Chapel, especially in the creation of Adam. Um, God is very feminine looking in the shape of his body. Uh, the chest seems full, the hips are somewhat wide, he does have muscular arms, obviously he has a beard. Um, I've had many students interested in the gender, um, 
the gender continuum that seems to be represented in um, the image of God as he creates Adam. Uh, you can also see a phenomenon that we call in art scintillation. Scintillation is when you place two colors next to each other that are the same value on the value scale, but um, have different colors. So the red that you see there is similar in color to this green um, fabric that weaves around God's um, back. And the green is something that Michelangelo is using to pull from the earth, the visual or the color. He's using it for visual purposes to carry your eye over to the other side. It gives it a balanced composition. Um, it also creates a lot of interest here. Michelangelo's color choices created tension within the work of art because they do scintillate and because they are on the same exact level on the value scale. Michelangelo places the figures in a way that um, creates a balanced composition. There are more figures uh, behind God because Adam sits on a larger space of earth. The tension is also created because Adam and God are almost touching hands, not quite there. Um, that small space between the two fingers is highly accentuated because it exists. Um, when something almost touches something, it highlights that space. The narrative actually reads from left to right, not right to left like we usually see. So we usually read from right to left. Here we see that the narrative is God um, transforms Adam um, from the left hand to the right side. The backdrop in the creation of Adam is much simpler than some of the other backdrops that we see in the um, other frescoes on the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It's because the thing that's going on is the most important thing in the painting. Michelangelo wants the creation of Adam um, to be the main dominant message in the painting. Um, but I also think it has to do with the readability from the ground looking upward. These three frescoes were the, the center three frescoes were the ones that um, Michelangelo did after he came back from his year long break and where he had worked out a lot of the kinks in representation so that information was clear from the ground when you were looking up at the ceiling. So what you're looking here is a cartoon for a tapestry that portrays Christ's charge to St. Peter. That's Christ um, telling Peter to follow him. The, um, it was originally uh, painted on paper, but now it's been transferred to canvas. A cartoon is a work of art that was a preparatory, um, I, we want to call it a sketch, but it was really a preparatory painting for a uh, weaving or a tapestry. So um, what you're looking at is the cartoon for that tapestry. Um, just a word about the tapestries. For centuries, tapestries were only unrolled for display in the Sistine Chapel on special occasions. Um, and so because of that and their age, some of the colors that we see 
um, presented have been altered a bit uh, from the cartoon to the tapestry. But typically, the cartoons are more sculptural in effect uh, because they're based on a drawing. Um, the tapestries tend to feel a little bit more painterly because they're woven. Um, in the tapestry that was created from this cartoon, there were metallic threads that were used um, to create a sense of depth in the surface and a sense of brilliance. Um, which in turn reminded the viewer of the flatness of the picture plane. So you get a lot of depth within the cartoon, but then when you look at the actual tapestry, uh, it sort of translates differently. And I'll show you that when I show you the tapestry here in a moment. Um, the tapestries were all woven in Brussels by Flemish weavers. Um, and of course, they didn't stay true completely to Raphael's design. Um, they changed the color of St. Peter's eyes and, um, oh, I'm sorry, they changed the color of St. Peter's robe from gold and blue to red and blue. And originally Christ wore a simple white robe like you see here and they change it to a starburst robe in the tapestry. Let's look at that tapestry. So here's the tapestry. You can clearly see that St. Peter is now kneeling um, and is uh, receiving a charge from Jesus. And of course, his garment has been changed from the yellow and blue, or the gold and blue, to red and blue. And then you can see Jesus' garment now has this starburst pattern all over it, um, when originally he wore just a simple plain white garment. You can also see the difference between the tapestry's painterly feel and the um, drawing that you saw, which was very sculptural. It had a sense of weightiness to it. I think this just comes from the inherent um, differences in medium. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to get a good sense of value uh, variation transferred over to um, an image like this. This is Bramante's Tempietto. Um, Bramante lived in Milan, and he was friends with da Vinci. Um, he was in his 50s uh, when he abandons painting and designs buildings. This is actually his first uh, architectural design. It's a circular building that's set in the center of a square. Um, he thought that if you visited this place, you would be at the center of the universe because um, mathematics are a universal language, and because um, this particular Tempietto sits in the center of the city's square. Um, it's a building that changed the way architects uh, perceive things. It changed the way that they approached things. So he designs the architecture with the three-dimensional ideas. Uh, still going off with that Renaissance idea of the cone or the pyramid. Um, it has mass and um, he pays attention to simple classical design ideas. Um, it has a central plan and it marks the exact spot where Peter was killed. So it has a religious purpose. Um, It has this mathematical context that we talked about. Um, it has harmonious proportions. To Bramante, the Gothic era was ugly uh, because it wasn't intellectual, because it didn't, it wasn't based on this idea of rationality that we see um, the humanists really delve into. Uh, for example, the man is the center of the universe with the circle and the square. Um, the idea that the pyramid creates balanced harmony and serenity. 
Um, so if it's not based on those mathematical compositions, the Renaissance masters don't feel that the things that they are presenting are beautiful. This particular work of art has many different um, uh, it has many different elements of classical antiquity. For example, here you see the um, stylobade uh, at the stairs right here. Um, the stylobate itself is one that you can enter the um, temple from any side. That's a Greek ideal, a classical Greek ideal. Um, the balustrade is right here. It goes completely around the tempietto. Uh, and then you see the um, colonnade that goes completely around the building as well. At the top, you see one of those caps, like we saw at the Florence Cathedral, um, and a dome. So these ideals were perfect to Bramante. And so he thinks that his building creates the opportunity for the man to enter the center of the universe. So here is Michelangelo's St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican at Rome. Um, it was started in 1545 and finished in 1564. It's the new St. Peter's. Remember, the original St. Peter's was knocked down by the Vatican um, to make way for this St. Peter's. Um, it has a central church plan, which means it is modeled after a Greek cross. Most churches have what we call a Roman cross plan, where the um, center of the church is longer than the arms of the church. But this church has a central cross floor plan, which means the arms and the center of the church are the same length. Um, I'll show you a floor plan so that you understand a little bit better what I mean. Um, the architecture is a fulfillment of the belief of the divine proportion system, just like we talked about with the Tempietto. Um, Michelangelo wanted to build the building to look like a, the dome of the Pantheon. Um, and so he puts it, the dome, he wants it to look like the dome of the Pantheon. And so he decides that he's going to set the dome on top of a central plan. Um, the church is in what we call colossal order. And you can see that it has a dome and then a fairly plain facade. There was a lot of criticism about Michelangelo's design, and the real big scandal had to do with the fact that when you walked far enough away from the facade of the church, you couldn't see the dome anymore. Um, the public thought it was ugly, and so uh, it created a great scandal in the um, Renaissance world. This is the church of Il Gesù. Um, you're looking at the front facade. It's located in Rome. It was probably the most influential building in the second half of the 16th century. Um, it was a mother church of the Jesuit order. There was a pope named Ignatius of Lilola. Um, he was a Spanish nobleman, and he dedicated his life to the service of God. Uh, he founded the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order's members were missionaries and they carried the message of Catholicism to the Americas, Asia, and Africa. Michelangelo was the original artist requested to design the Jesuit church, um, but he was late in providing the plans for the church. So in 1568, the Jesuits turned to Giacomo della Porta, um, who was responsible for the final facade. The plan of Il Gesù reveals a mon monumental expansion of Alberti's scheme for Santa and or for Sant Andrea in Mantua. Um, in the new Jesuit church, the nave takes over the main volume of space. Um, it makes the structure a great hall with side chapels. 
There's a dome that emphasizes the approach to the altar. Um, but above all, the space is adequate to accommodate the great crowds that gathered near um, the elegant or eloquent preaching that the Jesuits do. It had enormous impact on later church design. Uh, the union of the upper and lower stories is affected by the scrolls that you see and the buttressing. There's a slight amount of buttressing in the front of the building. Uh, this buttressing is important because as we move through the High Renaissance, we'll see that the Baroque take this buttressing a step further. Um, it has a classical pediment, this one that you see here in front of the building, where you would enter uh, from this one point. This is very Roman. The Romans had one point of entry for their temples, whereas the Greeks had multiple points of entry. We saw the multiple points of entries when we looked at the Tempietto. Now we're looking at a single point of entry um, in Il Gesù. So here I want you to compare the um, image of Il Gesù to the church of Santa Maria Novella. Um, Santa Maria Novella is one of the churches that we study in the um, Renaissance time. So this is a typical Renaissance facade of a church. And the thing that I want you to see when you compare the Church of Il Gesù to the Church of Santa Maria Novella is that the Church of Il Gesù is much more um, innovative and sophisticated architecturally. So you can see that the top and the bottom of the Church of Il Gesù have a relationship to one another. So the columns and the pillars that undulate in and out, while they are a precursor to the Baroque, they extend from the top to the bottom of the church. In addition to um, the side spandrels and the volutes that you see there, those um, are mirrored in the architecture in the bottom with the organicness of the Corinthian columns. So the sophisticated architecture of the Baroque is starting to emerge. And in that emergence, you can see that there's a shift from a more painting-like decorative feel of the High Renaissance building like Santa Maria Novella to a more sculptural feel like of the Church of Il Gesù. So let's stop for just a minute and let me talk to you a little bit about the um, Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation. This is sort of part of the history of um, Catholicism and Protestantism that you have to understand in order to understand the art going forward. Um, we're not going to see direct evidence of it right now, but we will see evidence of it later on in um, our discussions about the Renaissance. So it all starts with this guy here. His name is Martin Luther. And Martin Luther wakes up one day and says, I'm going to take a trip to Rome. And so he travels to Rome to visit Pope Julius, um, where Julius is building the new St. Peter's. Martin Luther lives in Germany, which is his home. And so um, he gets to Rome and he becomes very upset. Martin Luther is also upset because popes are having children out of wedlock. This is Pope Alexander the sixth um, son. It's his child. And so we all know that Catholics are not allowed, uh, popes, Catholic leaders are not allowed to um, be having sex at all because they aren't married and therefore they're having sex and out of wedlock on top of it. The other thing they were doing that was really upsetting Martin Luther is that they were practicing nepotism. Um, nepotism is the practice of hiring a family member uh, for a job that doesn't necessarily uh, have the qualifications to work that job. So um, they were appointing 
uh, family members in royal positions and in religious positions. Uh, the person that you see standing behind Leo is Leo's nephew, um, Luigi De Rossi. So Martin Luther gets really upset about these things that the Catholic Church is doing. And so he says, I won't step one foot back into church until these things are fixed. He goes back to Germany. He writes 95 things that he thinks are a problem within the church. Um, and we called it his thesis. That's where we get the modern day term, a thesis. It's a, a identification and a solving of a problem. Um, and so Martin Luther um, nails his 95 theses to the front of the Catholic Church in Germany and says, if you want me to come back, you're going to have to fix this stuff. That act caused the Protestant Reformation. Protestant Reformation was a new system of religious practices. The Protestant Reformation begins right after Martin Luther nails those 95 theses to the door of the German church in uh, 1517. The Catholics get wind of the Protestant Reformation and there is a big meeting held called the Council of Trent. It starts in 1545 and goes um, every year until 1563. During that time, um, the Catholic clergy set rules for artwork in the church. Um, we'll go over those rules next class, but for now I just want you to know that the Catholics launch a counter-reformation um, and it lasts from 1545 to 1648. One of the things that Martin Luther was upset about was the worship of graven images, meaning he felt like the, um, the churches were using pictures to um, worship. And so iconoclasm begins. Iconoclasm literally means the destruction of an image. Um, it's usually done for political or religious reasons. It was endorsed uh, by John Calvin. Uh, he's the one that started the um, United Methodist movement. But Martin Luther did not agree with destroying the images. Um, but there were waves of iconoclasm um, throughout Northern Europe. Uh, it began in about the 1500s in Zurich, Switzerland, and just keeps going throughout Northern Europe. So now that you understand what was going on politically in Italy and throughout Northern Europe, let's look at what's going on um, in Italy in terms of those two schools of thought that I talked about um, in terms of artwork. School of thought number one is the Desenio style. It's the style that Michelangelo, Leonardo, Raphael used to create um, paintings. It is the school of thought that is used on the left-hand side, uh, which you're looking at as a drawing of the creation of Adam. Um, all paintings begin with a drawing in Desenio. It creates a situation that, or it creates a stylistic feature in the painting that the painting tends to take on a form that looks more sculptural in technique. The other school of thought is called Colore. Colore is a style that's very popular in the Venetian world. Um, Venice is part of Italy up at the top of the boot and it sits on a waterway. And everything in Venice has more of a laid-back, sensual feeling. Those crisp lines that we're used to seeing in the Desenio style 
change in the Calore style. First of all, in the Calore style, um, the painting is constructed on the painting. They paint in what we call a la prima, or directly onto the canvas. It gives the figure a less uh, harsh look in terms of its volume. The lines of the figure are not quite as abrupt. And we see um, lots of beautiful shapes come together. This is Giorgione's painting, The Tempest. It was done in 1506. It's oil on canvas. Um, Giorgione's teacher, well, actually, Bellini was Giorgione's teacher, um, but Giorgione goes on to be Titian's teacher. And so we get this line of succession in terms of Venetian um, Renaissance art that is quite um, significant in the history of art. Um, we talked about the Colore style as being softer and more sensual. The figure and the form are created directly on the canvas instead of from um, a beginning drawing. And so the edges of the form tend to be softer. Um, they tend to not be quite as harsh. And they seem to have more emotion and more sensuality to them. You can see um, the texture of the skin as being soft and supple, as opposed to Raphael's figures that look like they were giant statues. Um, this particular painting is one of an imagined scene. The shepherd boy who's standing there watching the um, land is paying no attention to the female whatsoever. She's completely nude and sitting there breastfeeding her baby. Um, in real life, if there was a man sitting in the park and there was a female sitting uh, not too far from him who was completely nude, he would probably be looking at her. Um, the painting has a sense of sensuality and emotional intimacy that we don't really see in the Florentine paintings. Even the emotional intimacy that we see like between Mary and the child tends to be less um, intimate than what we see here in Giorgione's Tempest. Um, the child's suckling, um, you can see that the um, figure is connected more so to the child and the figure doesn't look so weighty and um, is more soft. You can also see that the man standing in the front that's watching over the land sort of looks off into the distance. The background has this very um, moody looking background to it. Uh, it has quite a bit of atmospheric perspective in that we get a good foreground, middle ground, and background. And um, you can see that the Venetian paintings tend to focus more so on layering texture. Uh, here you have the texture of the grass, you have the texture in the middle ground of the trees, and in the background of the sky. So let's take a look at the concept again that we talked about Venetian Renaissance um, when we look at Titian's work. Remember, he's a pupil of Giorgione's and he is taught in Venice. This is Titian's Pastoral Symphony. Um, we see a figure that comes out of the dense shadows it emerges and forms um, a soft landscape. The mood tends to be more tranquil um, and dreamy-like. It evokes 
a landscape of a lost but not forgotten paradise. The men that sit in the center of the painting are having a conversation. The women are nude, pouring water from a well, and playing a musical instrument. Take a good long look at the painting and see if you can figure out something that feels a little odd about the painting. Hopefully you came up with the fact that the men are looking at each other and not the women. Um, typically, if you're sitting there with a person having a conversation, there are two nude people around you. You're probably looking at the nude people, not each other. Um, because of this, we call this painting a, um, a mirage. The women are a mirage or they're a poetic muse. They're not actually um, to represent the actual female nude. You can see that the um, artist is focused on not only the uh, figures in the front, but also creating a landscape that is very soft and sensual, that has a sense of emotion coming through. The shepherd in the background symbolizes the poet, the pipe and the lute symbolize poetry. And that's why we think the two women in the front are their muse because they're composing with the lute and the flute. The bodies of the women are very softly modeled. You can tell how the flesh turns in the light. In fact, they're so softly modeled that you can almost imagine the flesh being um, sort of loose and jiggly. Um, the woman standing in the front turns to lift water out of a well um, it's a sacred well of poetic inspiration. This painting changes the style of Venetian Renaissance art for the rest of the high Renaissance time. Figures become fuller and um, the poetic personification of the nature's abundance becomes popular to represent. So this is Titian's Pessero Madonna. Um, Titian was actually trained by both Bellini and Giorgione. Um, and he learned so well from both of them that today's scholars really can't concur about the degree of participation that he had in Giorgione and Bellini's later works. Bellini dies in 1516. Um, and the Republic of Venice then appoints Titian as its official painter. Uh, shortly after, Bishop Jacopo Pesaro commissioned him to paint the Madonna of the Pesaro family. Um, and he presented it to the Church of the Ferrari, um, which already housed Titian's Assumption of the Virgin. Um, it has rich textures and a dazzling display of color, uh, which furthered Titian's reputation and established his personal style. Pesaro was the commander of the Papal Fleet, and he had a successful expedition in 1502 against the Turks. Um, during the Venetian-Turkish War, he commissioned this painting in gratitude. The setting is sunlit and Madonna's 
sitting in her palace in heaven. Uh, Mary receives the commander who kneels dutifully at the foot of her throne. A soldier, possibly St. George, is behind the commander and carries a banner. He's the guy with the tall orange banner there um, that has a shield with a coat of arms of the Borgia, um, who was Pope Alexander VI family. Um, this time a coat of arms, a family coat of arms was very common. So it was just um, Pope Alexander VI family coat of arms. Um, behind him we see a man who has on a turban and a prisoner of war from the Christian forces. St. Peter appears seated at the steps of the throne and St. Francis introduces other Pissarro family members, members um, all of them being male. Um, they are Italian depictions of donors. In this area typically exclude women and children. So we only see men in terms of the donors. He's the man who's kneeled um, to the right in the bright red cloak. Titian entwines the human and the heavenly here, constructing a tableau. Um, in terms of Renaissance protocol and um, country splendor, or I'm sorry, courtly splendor. Uh, a prime characteristic of the High Renaissance painting is this massive monumental figure. Um, we see figures that are large and weighty. We see them singly and in groups. Uh, Titian places the figures on the step diagonally. Um, he positions the Madonna in this X pattern. He wants to focus the composition well off the central axis. Uh, and so he draws attention to Madonna in this way. Now, if you make a pyramid out of the placement of the people, you can see where that pyramid influence comes in, just like the rest of the High Renaissance painters. Um, you also see that Titian seems to have a hybrid of the Venetian Renaissance and some of the inland Italian masters of the Disegno style. His figures are a little bit more weighty than that of Giorgione's, um, and the fabrics seem to have a bit more sculptural feel, but we still consider Titian to be Venetian Renaissance. So this is Titian's The Venus of Urbino. It's a very famous painting in the history of art. Um, many scholars that go after Titian or artists that come after Titian um, utilize this particular work of art as an inspiration for their work of art. Um, the one that comes to mind uh, right away is Manet. Um, this portrait really uh, is based on Titian's main accomplishments. Um, it's a wedding portrait for a young girl. Uh, she was given the portrait as a way to remind her of her duties to her husband um, and to school her on her intimate obligations in the marriage. The dog that sits at the end of her feet is a symbol of fidelity, same concept of where we get the term Fido. And you can see how soft and sensual the painting is. Um, it reveals the delicacy of the tender skin of the um, model. You can see how her flesh delicately turns in the light. Um, it has a very sense of innocence to it, um, an innocence that's getting ready to move on into womanhood. You see that there's a child and a governess behind 
um, the bed as this half wall seems to reveal another set setting in the room. Um, it is one point perspective, but then you get this funky wall here um, that's behind the Venus, and so it has some interesting sense of space. Um, the young child looks in a toy chest as the governess watches on. This is a symbol that the um, childhood of the woman that is being presented to you is now leaving and that she is moving on and growing up into her wifely duties. Titian pays great attention to the texture of the fabric and the model looks shyly at the viewer um, in a demure way, uh, turning her gaze away from you. We see um, a sense of, like I said, the atmospheric perspective due to the layering of the architectural elements, but we don't get a full one-point perspective. This is Veronese's Feast in the House of Levi. It is from the refectory of the monastery of Giovanni e Paolo in Venice. Um, it's 18 feet by 42 feet. It's a very large painting. Um, Verona, Ver, Veron, Veronese, sorry, my Italian's only so good and it's getting late, um, specialized in splendid pageantry, um, superb color, and classical architecture. You can see the classical architecture um, that he constructs as a backdrop to the scene. Um, the scene was originally a Last Supper scene, but it was done for the Catholic Church. And the Catholic Church had dictated some rules about how they wanted art to appear. Um, they wanted it to be as true to the biblical story as possible. Um, and so when Veronese took it to uh, the Catholic Church, they rejected it, and he had to go back and redo some of it. Because of that, he changed it from um, the title being The Last Supper to Feast in the House of Levi. Uh, Veronese usually works in a very large format. Um, typically, his canvases are about 20 feet by 30 feet. Um, here he paints Christ in the House of Levi. Um, and it was, uh, Christ sits at the center of the, um, garbled elite in Venice. In the foreground, we see a chief steward that welcomes guests. Uh, he robs lords of their colorful retainers, dogs, and dwarves crowd into this very spacious loggia. Loggia is simply a covered area, and it's an Italian word. Um, this really prompted criticism from the Catholic Church, and they accuse Veronese of impiety for painting such creatures so close to the Lord, and they order him to make changes at his own expense. So, he decided he was just going to change the painting's title. This is Tintoretto's The Last Supper. It's in the church of San Giorgio Maggiore in Venice. And it was done in 1592 to 1594. It's 12 feet by almost 19 feet. Um, this painting really accentuates the moment where Christ breaks bread in the transubstantiation. The transubstantiation is the act of turning the water and the bread into the flesh and blood of Christ. It's why you see um, Christ there in the painting with light rays coming from behind his back as he lifts a chalice to the man who is sitting next to him. Uh, the man who was sitting next to him as he drinks from the chalice 
glows um, in the bright light that beams from Jesus. And then the man beside the one drinking also has the light reflected at him. Um, the Protestants throw this particular painting out the window. Tintoretto paints a la prima, which means he paints directly on the canvas. Um, he also uses a vanishing point that's a little wonky. He puts it in the upper right hand corner. Um, so everything seems to be drawn to that really dramatic angle. Um, he depicts a scene that's holy in the hustle and bustle of life. You can see the people around the table doing their own thing, um, working in what looks like some sort of tavern. Um, Christ is no longer the central figure at the table. He still sits, though, in the center of the composition. The lighting is dusky and murky, and the crowd is somewhat contorted. And we get the idea of two different realms, an earthly realm and a spiritual realm. And the humanist idea here is that the spiritual realm comes down, affects, and possesses the human realm. This is Palladio's Villa Rotunda. Um, you're looking at the exterior view of the Villa Rotunda. It's in um, Venice. They began it in the 1560s. And it's a private villa, which means it was only used as a summer residence for um, who we think were friends of Palladio's. Um, it's near Venice, and it has a central cross plan. It also has a dome that um, is located at the central cross. Um, it has four facades, just like uh, a temple would, like temple portals, basically. And each facade has its own point of entry. You can see the classical revival here because each um, projection, the north, south, east, and west sides, all have um, porticos that are very similar to the pantheons. In the center, you see the um, dome at the top of the Villa Rotunda. It is, again, reminiscent of the pantheon's dome. Palladio had to actually write an architectural treatise in order to build this particular house here. Um, it was used by Palladio's rich friends as a summer home. And by modeling it after the Pantheon, uh, Palladio is hoping to evoke all of the national or the um, civic pride and duties that were required by the um, Romans in classical antiquity.